Shall we pray? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Forgive us for all of our sins and our shortcomings. And Lord, thank you that you have even delivered us from us and using us for thee. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place today to have your way. That these, your people, might be edified, that Jesus the Christ might be glorified, and that the devil himself may be horrified. Have your way today, Lord. That through this South Dallas concert choir, as they are presenting the seven last words of Christ, pray for every preacher who is here, every lay speaker, for every song that shall be sang. Pray for our leader. Thank you, Sister Roberts, and her vision. We pray, God, that you will continue to be with her and use her in spite of what the enemy has been trying to do. Have your way in this place, Lord, that the spirit will just break out in this place, that someone will come asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Have your way today, Lord. This is the first time in over two years that many of us have gathered together for the first time. So Holy Spirit, have your way for those who are watching us via YouTube and via Facebook Live, God, on this Good Friday. We pray, God, that you will help them even through the screen to experience that which we are experiencing here in the physical house of God. Because your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And just a few days, God, we're going to see your spirit break out. As your son shall be raised from the dead with all power in his hand. So we're here today to celebrate your goodness and your grace, your grandeur and glory. And until we shall see you face to face, we want to continue to pilgrim down here that one day we may hear you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church said, Amen. Amen and Amen.
blessings flow. On behalf of New Hope Baptist Church, the Chancel Choir, our pastor, Reverend Dr. Damian N. Williams, I welcome you with open arms, with heartfelt love, and unspeakable joy. We count it all joy today, and any time we have the opportunity to welcome members, friends, family, and guests to our church. We welcome and feel truly blessed to have the cadre of ministers and the South Dallas Concert Choir to present the seven last words of Christ in word and song on this beautiful Palm Sunday. We cherish the relationship that we have formulated with the South Dallas Concert Choir, and we look forward to many more opportunities to glorify God in song. We welcome you to praise and worship God today as the Spirit of the Lord permeates this sanctuary. This program today is dedicated in memory of our faithful and loyal choir member, Dr. Yandel Moore, Sr. May God bless and keep each of you. You are welcome, welcome, welcome. We thank you for allowing us this opportunity again. It has been, what, five, six, seven years that this collaboration started uh, when Mrs. Ms. Roberts uh, first came to us. She, she said, there's some things that we need to do that's different. There are some places that we need to go, and there are some people that we need to reach. Yes. And so she said that we need to take our music to our neighborhoods and to those other areas who do not have an appreciation for our black music. And so the music that you will hear today will be music that has been written by black composers, and a lot of it has been arranged by our own Miss Roberts. So today, we say thank you, and we pray that you be for what's coming.
Good evening. Good evening. We thank God for yet another opportunity to stand and proclaim the riches of his word. Protocol has been established. Uh, we do thank God for this privilege, uh, and this wonderful opportunity to meet uh, those of you who we have never seen or experienced this fellowship with before. The first word on this evening is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse number 34. And it reads, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a powerful word. As we take this time of the year to reflect upon what our Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago, it's somewhat difficult to process what he went through physically for us. He was beaten all night long. Hair was pulled from his beard. He was struck in the face, mocked. A crown of 72 thorns were placed upon his forehead. He was marched up a hill called Calvary. Nailed to a cross. They hung him high stretched him wide. In the face of all of those difficulties, the past pain, the present predicament, Christ looks out and makes this powerful declaration. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This, my brothers and my sisters, was a mediatorial word that he offers as explicatory to the intent and the meaning of his death. But he wanted the world to know why this was happening. He wanted us to realize that what he was doing, it was not for him, but it was for us. How, you may ask, can a man facing this type of debilitating feeling and this overwhelming urge to seek physical comfort would utter these words at this time? But what it speaks to, my brothers and my sisters, is his fixed resolution. He was fixed on his resolution. He would not allow the pain that he was experiencing at the time to deter him from what he was come to do. Isn't that good news? I thank God for folk like that that can experience pain, experience hurt, experience disappointment, and still stay focused on what God has called them to do. Uh, we ought to thank God for people like that in our lives that face difficulty. They don't stand because everything is good, but they stand because they have a fixed resolution. What was his fixed resolution? Well, I'm glad you asked. His fixed resolution was on producing what I would call a fruitful relationship with man. You see, in the garden, our relationship became fractured. We used to walk in the cool of the evening and talk to the Lord, but because of sin, that relationship became fractured. But Jesus was resolute on fixing that relationship so that we would be able to come before the very presence of God talk to him and tell him all about our circumstances and situations. But I thank God that he understood that this was one of his resolutions, but please hear me now. The reason he had this fixed resolution for a fruitful relationship and, and he knew what had to be done, so he realized the only way a fruitful relationship could be produced, forgiveness was required. Oh yes, uh, we had to have something done about our sin. Oh yes, forgiveness was required in order for us to be able to approach God. Our sins needed forgiving. 
And as the word declares, y'all know the old song say, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? We, we are in church, aren't we? Y all, y all, y all, I, I almost feel like I'm looking at a picture, a, a photograph. Amen. Y'all realize that only because of the blood of Jesus could our sins be forgiven. And I am so grateful that he interceded on our behalf. Aren't you glad today that he made intercession for us? He made intercession for our involvement and our ignorance. He says, Father, forgive them. He needed no forgiveness. He had done nothing wrong. Never said a word wrong. Never did anything wrong. But he said, forgive them. Before we wag our fingers at the soldiers and at the religious leaders, my brothers and my sisters, you must know why he hung on that tree. It was not simply for the sins of the soldiers and the sins of the religious leaders. But you and I, my brothers and my sisters, because of our sin, we needed forgiveness because he was hanging on the tree for you and for me. But I thank God that he made this prayer request. But what's even better than his prayer request was this. He not only prayed for us, but then he became our propitiation. He said, not only will I ask the Father to forgive them, but I will be their substitute. So, Father, what they do to me, although I do not deserve it, I'm going to die in their place so they could get what I deserve. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he, he's, he's the one that deserves to be in glory with the Father. He was there in the beginning. But what he does, he carves out a way for you and I, my brothers and my sisters, to be able to enjoy the presence of God unhindered by the presence, the power, and the penalty of sin. Oh, and I thank God for that. I shout every Sunday because I realized that it should have been me. But I bless the name of Jesus that he loved me so much. He was fixed on helping me get to glory. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They, they don't understand because if they knew that they were crucifying the Savior of the world, they wouldn't have done it. But aren't you glad that they did? Hallelujah. We bless his name on today knowing that because of his prayer and his propitiation for our sins, you and I, my brothers and my sisters, have an opportunity to be saved and set free. God bless you. Thank you, Bishop sharing that word with us on, on uh, this evening. I'm going to pause for a moment and, and ask the family of uh, Dr. Yondell Moore to stand as they are here today. Amen. Amen. We want to pause. Can we thank God for them? Amen. 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 Uh, 
Dr. Moore may not mean a whole lot to you all, and many of you may not know who he is, but he means a whole lot to us. He and his wife, Sister Frida, were taken away from us uh, late this past year, and um, we had a double funeral here at the New Hope Baptist Church, and we are continually praying for this family as they're still trying to navigate this newness of life without um, mother and their father, uh, step, stepmother and their father. And Dr. Moore would be sitting right behind me, directly behind me now with those handsome men you see behind me. Since 2017, uh, when the collaboration with the South Dallas Concert Choir and the New Hope Baptist Church came together, he would be there. He was a faithful deacon here at the New Hope Baptist Church, and he was also a staunch supporter of the South Dallas Concert Choir, and he's going to be so, so missed. So family, know that we love you, and we have not stopped praying for you, and uh, God bless each of you. Amen. 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 My assignment is word number two. That is found in Luke chapter 2, verse, it said verse number 43, before you to get the context, verse 39 says, one of the criminals who hang railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do, not, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed justly. We are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. My brothers and sisters, the scene is Calvary. It was a place of, of suffering and sorrow, sadness, shame, and even death. It's a place of intense pain and eternal loss. And in the real sense, friends, uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus was dying that day and two other men were also being put to death. We do not know much about these men. We do not know their names. Uh, we do not know their past. All we know is they were called malefactors or criminals which means villains or evil doers or even thieves. What I find interesting in the text are their differences. When we look at their external lifestyle, if you would, the fear of God one had and the other one was just trying to get a hookup. Hey man, hey man, save yourself, but in the process, save us. Uh, we're still living in a day where men and women do not fear God. They want him to be some kind of spiritual bunny in a rabbit or something, a genie in a hat that you, when he comes out, you want your wish, but when he tells you how to do and run your life, you say back into the bottle you go. Uh, because we want him to be our savior, but not our Lord. There's a difference. Lord, save me, but don't lead my life. Uh, and that's the difference in the external life of these two men. One said, I know I messed up. I deserve to die. And the other one said, look, I'm just looking for a hookup. Why are you saving yourself? If it's true what they say about you, save me in the process, Jesus. Uh, but then we see a difference in their decision while here on earth. Watch this. One rejected him and one received him. And my brothers and sisters and, and the one who received him says that while the one thief was listening to the crowd, the rulers and the soldiers, the other one was listening to Jesus in verse 34 when he says, Father, forgive them for they don't have a clue what they're doing because you do know he could have called and gotten saved from what he was going through. But he had to go through it so that you and I didn't have to go through it. 
And so consequently, while one was rejecting him and the other one was receiving him, it hadn't always been that way because earlier the same thief had joined everyone else in mocking Jesus. And remember, it's the same week that they're saying, Hosanna one day and a few days later, kill the no good rascal. One rejected him while the other received him. One, uh, he was sinless, but he was also the savior uh, because he was sovereign. He, he, he had everything in control and under his control. And on the one hand, friends, while the differences that they made here on earth may have been different, watch this, one saw him as a liar to be ridiculed and the other one saw him as the Lord to be received. One saw him as a clown and the other saw him as the Christ. One saw him as a foolish sinner while the other saw him as the father's son. One saw him as a wretched loser and the other one saw him as the wonderful savior who is the Lord. One saw him as a pitiful buffoon and the other one saw him as a precious benefactor. One saw him at just as another sinner and the other one saw him as the savior who is getting ready to die but yet come again. But then finally friends we see something about their their, their, their final destination. One has a destiny of hopelessness because all he can see is the here and now. And the other one says, listen, I need to see a, a destiny of hope. Lord, I, I need what you have for me. And he paused there dying long enough to have a revival meeting. And Jesus says, you don't have to wait till tomorrow. Today. Matter of fact, the old King James 1611 authorized version says, Verily, verily, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Look, just because you came to church for an Easter cantata, I dare not come to the conclusion that everybody in here knows Jesus. So let me just say something about salvation. It is instantaneous. You don't need 59.95. You don't have to spin around three times and say he's mine. You don't need any water and wipe it on your head. All you have to say is Jesus save me. And he says today you will be with me in paradise and I don't know about you but I got a sneaky suspicion and a holy hunch if we just fall down on our face and call out to a holy God and say Lord save me watch this this man didn't have time to go home and ask his wife does he need to talk to her he didn't have time to go call his preacher and say pastor what do you think I ought to do he said I can get ready to die and I, my soul gonna go to hell but since this is the one who I've heard so much about let me give him a try and say Lord I'm sorry I've messed up time and time again I know you are holy I know you are sinless I know you've made no mistakes and if you are who you say you are. Lord, forgive me for all of my sins and my shortcomings. And Jesus said, bro, I got one better for you. I'm going to see you on the other side. And I just want to know, is there anybody here today who wants to see him on the other side? And if you want to see him on the other side, men and women, we got to get ready for forever. Today. Today. And today. God bless you.
let's give God some praise for all that we've heard so far. Let's give God some praise for all that we've heard so far. Amen. I am going to be talking to you all for the next seven minutes on John chapter 19, verses 26 through 27, New King James Version. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. I want to use for a topic, Mary's firstborn. Mary's firstborn. There is a firstborn challenge on the platform of Facebook. And all over Facebook, parents are posting pictures of their firstborn sons and daughters. I know because I posted a picture of my firstborn daughter, Bianca. And whoever started this challenge say that the goal is to flood Facebook with positive photos. I wish I had some Facebook readers in here on today. If Mary had subscribed to Facebook, I know that she would have been more than proud to post a picture of Jesus. For Luke chapter 2 verse 7 tells us that Jesus was Mary's firstborn. In this text, we find Jesus nailed to a cross in excruciating pain. In his physical heart, he knows that he's about to die. But in his, in his spiritual heart, he knows that God's plan is about to be fulfilled. I wish I had some help in here on today. This scripture touches my heart in two ways. Can I, can I share them with you? First of all, it touched my heart as a mother because it says that in Jesus' final moments of his life, out of all the things that he could have been thinking about, Jesus was thinking about his mother. In the Jewish custom, it was the responsibility of the firstborn son to take care of the parents. And obviously Jesus' stepfather had passed away and Jesus had assumed the responsibility for his mother. So Jesus was handling his business as a firstborn. Notice that Jesus did not address her as mother. He did not call her mom or my dear, but he addressed her as woman. In the Greek word, woman is a term of endearment. But in English, if you were to call your mother woman, you might get a backhand. <laughs> but understand the context from which Jesus is speaking. Jesus is nailed to a cross. Jesus is in a hostile environment. Jesus was among terrorists and murderers. And he did not want to call attention to Mary by addressing her as his mother because he wanted to protect her. That is the characteristic of a firstborn and a good son. So in this intimate exchange, he assigns his best friend, John, who is also his disciple, to take care of his mother. John did not have to think about this request. John didn't hesitate on this request. John didn't have to go and ask the wife about this request. Why? Because I believe that knowing Jesus and his infinite wisdom and in his relationship with John, they had discussed this beforehand. Number two, it touched my heart because I am a firstborn to my mom. Because Jesus stayed true to the commandments to honor his mother as well as his father. His crucifixion was in honor of his heavenly father. But Jesus remembered also to honor his mother as well. To honor your mother and your father is one of the big ten. I wish I had some worshipers in here on today. 
this scripture is a direct challenge of all of the firstborns whose pictures are plastered all over Facebook. It's a message to all of the firstborns who are looking at me right now. Live up to your responsibility. Love your parents and do as much for them as you can. You may not be able to give them money, but when was the last time you checked on your mama? When was the last time you checked in on your father? If you would allow me to use a phrase from a country singer, Cody Johnson said, do it till you can't. Honor your father and your mother till you can't. Spend time with them till you can't. Because one day, when the morning comes, mama's gonna get up out of here. One day, when the morning comes, father's gonna shut his eyes and you won't be able to. That's why I want to let you know today, not only does Jesus teach us that we need to take care of our mom and our fathers, but he also teaches us that when our backs are against the cross, when our backs are against the wall, we do not compromise the word of God. When our backs are against the wall, we do not compromise what it is we believe. That's why I stand with the people of Ukraine, because when they found themselves being invaded by Russia, they did not compromise their democracy. They were determined to fight to the finish. In America, we have not been invaded by a country, but our democracy has been invaded. And it's an inside job. When they fail, when they fail to accept the results of the election, and they insurrected our nation's capital. It was a scud missile that hit our democracy. When Congress failed to pass voting rights, they dropped a bomb on us, y'all. They dropped a bomb on our democracy. Oh, America, don't sleep. Democracy in America is democracy everywhere. Now give God some praise and give them some glory for Mary's firstborn. My God, today, I am excited and grateful for the opportunity to stand with all these amazing preachers. Thank you. Holy Spirit, do it again. Our Father, our Lord, our Comforter an expression of Jesus that is shown for in, in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. Relating to the darkness, relating to the temperament of the elements, relating to the cry of the wind, relating to the clouds that, flow, that are flowing dull instead of shining bright, as it should be at three o'clock in the afternoon. At three o'clock, the elements cried out. Along with the elements, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is now walking through the process of the messianic prophetic fulfillment. He cried out with an anguished tone from him, his human painful flesh. A deserted cry, if you will. Feeling separated from his father, separated from the Holy Spirit, separated from his disciples, followers, and his mother. This cry is coming from a place of when he reached out to the disciples and they were nowhere to be found. But looking around the corner in the dark to see what's going on. 
This is a cry where he seems to be all alone. My God, my God makes it personal. Understand that sometimes we must go through some things alone. This passage helps us to see when we experience tragedies and trials, our focus should be on God. I know we want to go through things and, and tell everybody about it, but sometimes we must go through certain things alone. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked the disciples to stay and pray with him. You know you always have somebody, can you just stay and pray with me? But they stayed asleep, they fell asleep because they didn't understand the depth of his suffering. Sometimes we have to go through certain things alone. The hour has come for Jesus to go through what he had been talking about for the last three and a half years. They watched him heal the sick. They, they watched him open the eyes of the blind. They watched him cause the lame to walk, touch the casket, and the dead came alive. The time has come for Jesus to go through the process which he came to do. Jesus struggled in public. public. Jesus' pain was purposeful. Jesus' suffering was paraded. His struggle was public. His pain was purposeful. His suffering was paraded, but his prayer was personal. Sometimes we have to go through certain things alone so that God will be glorified and the people will be edified. Are our prayer lives personal or are we praying lofty prayers so that others can see and cast praise upon us? His prayer was personal. The word my is relating to me or myself, especially as possessor, agent, object, or an action or familiar person. Jesus' struggle, pain, suffering was personal in his prayer life. Jesus, in his human form, pressed into God, made it personal by saying, my. Somebody say, my. God is familiar with Jesus, but Jesus is in God in the human form. Webster design, defines my as relating to me. Jesus relates my God, my God, as a personal attachment and not an indictment. What do you mean attachment? If Jesus is God and God is Jesus, they are one in the same. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, take this bitter cup away from me, but nevertheless, let your will be done. Since my is personal, sometimes we have to go through certain things by ourselves. Jesus knew his purpose, but in the midst of his pain, he still knew how to holler, my God. It was Judge Katanji Kant Brown Jackson who sat at the desk in the front of the Judiciary Committee. Her husband couldn't answer for her. Her daughters couldn't answer for her. Her friends couldn't answer for her. Because sometimes we got to go through something by ourselves. No matter what we have to go through, sometimes we got to go through it by ourselves. No matter what we go through, no matter how painful it is, no matter the why, we will, we shall be the reality of our ancestors' dream. God is in Jesus' form was the reality of God's word. Jesus came so that we might have the right to eternal life. He didn't matter what Pilate did. It didn't matter what Herod did. It didn't even matter that they became friends after hurting each other. It didn't matter 
what the sinner did or did not do. My God is the only one that can get me through this. My God is the only one that I can pray to. My God is the only source that can give me the hookup. God is the only one I can depend on. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because sometimes we must go through certain things by ourselves.
The Passion Translation of the 19th chapter of John, verse 28 reads like this. Jesus knew that his mission was accomplished. And to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. There was a dedicated senior level executive who walked into her office on a regular Monday morning. She took out her laptop out of her designer briefcase and secured her designer purse in the bottom file cabinet and prepared to log in for the day. Her credentials did not allow her to sign in to her digital workspace. So she immediately walked down the hallway to her boss's office and said, hey, good morning. Is the internet down again? And her boss said, have a seat. To her surprise, the boss said, thanks for your 25 years of service. We're going in a different direction. Sign here for your severance pay. One month to the date of her job layoff, she received a phone call that her only child, she and her husband tried repeatedly to conceive, was in a tragic car accident and not expected to make it through the night. And now three months later, she was dealing with the layoff the death of her only child, and after yet another job interview, she returned home to find it emptied out of her most prized possessions, and a note that read, it's been real. But it's time I live my life with my two new girlfriends, and I left you the house, the car, your clothes, uh, and access to one of our bank accounts. Sign, I'm about that life. Now, whether you can identify with the loss of an ideal job, the loss of loved ones, or those, uh, the loss of a marriage, a love relationship, after you have been granted everything you pleaded and prayed to God to bestow, I just stop by this evening to remind you of the phrase, God allows transitions to get our attention. The phrase autographed in my book by Cheryl Mayo Williams in her book, Transitions, meeting God in the midst of change, a journey of faith that dawned on me that while we've been living our lives focused on the, pull, the, the pursuit of happiness through our relationship goals, our career aspirations, our homes, our cars, our business ventures, our beauty, shoes and clothes and acquisition of the preferred educational and professional and civic and political affiliations, maybe we have lost sight of how circumstances can change within the blinking of the eyes. Uh, maybe we need to pause and reflect and evaluate what's really going on and what should really matter and what should be given our undivided attention now. The Reverend Robert L. Lyons writes in this same transitions book, one of the most decimating feelings in the world is to get to the top of your ladder and receive the, the realization that you've been leaning on the wrong building. Leaning on the wrong building can lead us to having a sinking and shifty foundation that can surface when trials and tribulations come on every hand, every way, and from every one of our corners of our lives. Yes, we know how to praise God in the welcome transitions of elementary and middle and high school and college and workforce to armed forces and single to married and unemployed to fully employed. But oh baby, when the unwelcomed, unwarranted, and un announce uh, transitions just slap us in our faces it makes it difficult to say praise is what I do when I'm going through those unexpected transitions try our patience and, pers and perseverance to keep singing time is filled with swift transitions but I'm going to build our hope on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand but when unsolicited transitions leave directly messages in our inboxes and arrive at our doorsteps it can make us feel like our daily trial trials and tribulations have us crucified on our own crosses and repeated transitions can make us feel stuck out of control and limited by our present dilemmas waiting for God's guidance and instructions about the next to move forward towards our future while we are in the midst 
of transition, God sometimes requires and instructs us to be still. While the next door is opened and created or while some obstacles and some people are moved out of harm's way, transitions can cause us to become thirsty for more. Thirsty for more tangible reminders of the, because the waiting, the pacing, the crying, the wishing, the hoping, the pleading, the praying, the singing, and the looking around at other folks' houses can make us have a thirst for more. Yeah. Our thirst can cause us to cash in and exchange the intangible things of peace and love and tranquility and happiness and contentment and fulfilling our God-appointed and divine assignments for titles and tabernacles and territories and tantalizing temporary comforts that will compromise our mission here on earth, which is called for us to be bringing the lost, the least, the loveless, the lonely to our redeemer named Jesus. When we are thirsty, our ability to testify about the valleys that try to vex our spirits, the mud holes that try to stain our brains, and the hills that we had to teach ourselves how to climb just to get higher and closer to the mountaintop to talk to Jesus. That thirst can make our testimonies feel insignificant and not as victorious as the one shouting and advertising on Facebook, Twitter, IG, and keeping up with the TikTok. <laughs> When we are thirsty for more, it can make us seem bitter, broken, bruised, bewildered because our tastes have changed. We start to notice that what used to quench our thirst because of the complexities of our current situations and transitions just doesn't do it for us anymore. You know, we start to show signs that our tastes have, have changed after we've visited at least five different virtual worship services, attended Sunday school, read the daily devotion, listened with, while we're multitasking to the three sermons from our top five of the preferred uh, preachers and been present at all nights of the latest spiritual awakening conference. And yet we are still walking Walking away thirsty for more. It's time to turn to God and turn and see that tasting and seeing again that the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting while we are waiting in our transitions of life. Recently, Reverend Walter Gibson preached about when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness experiences. We must be aware of halt. Everybody say halt. When we are hungry, angry, tired, and lonely. I believe that transitions are a part of our wilderness experiences because the temptations come and seep into our spaces just when we're waiting for God to reveal what's next. Just when we're in the middle of being in between the blessings. Just when we are betwixt the familiar and the unfamiliar. Just when we are anticipating better is on the way if I can just hold my peace and let God fight it for me. When God reveals we are in the transitory state, keep moving forward. In the physical movement, Jesus can meet us there and give us a taste of his living water. The Journey Church notes that water stands for worship, admit, thanks, empty, and request. And when we practice water, we connect, we reconnect, and we stay connected to Jesus by inviting Jesus into those spaces to transform us. During our transitions, we practice water to turn toward Jesus, to taste and see that the Lord is still good and his mercy still endures forever. When we have accomplished what God has guided us to do for the building of God's kingdom, it's time to embrace and welcome the transitions to new territories, to new spaces, to expand our circle of people, to move forward with new goals to incorporate. Our tastes have changed because it might be time to move forward knowing that Jesus 
has, has shown us that our mission with that person, that job, that career, that community endeavor, that position, that income level, that church or that level of discipleship with, with the Lord, our tastes have changed because we need to move to the Lord and run and taste and see that the Lord is still good. In the midst of transition, time is up for settling for the same old tap water, the same sweet tea because it's convenient, the same adult libation because that's the only one you know how to mix and make. Time is up for us to keep worshiping God only with the music from decades past and outdated traditions that need to be sunset. Time out for only worshiping and talking and praying and seeking God only on our own terms. Jesus is still thirsty for us to turn toward him running because we are finally accepting the fact that we are too dehydrated and we are way too tired to try to save ourselves our younger people have lost their taste for church simply because as church as simply as business as usual and not meeting their needs for a supernatural authentic encounter with Jesus and they need Jesus in their own language so that they can go out and make disciples in the world and not just sit in our sanctuaries but bring somebody else with them meet them meet people where they are just like Jesus showed us that he goes to meet the people in the greatest and we his hour to strengthen them through their struggle. Sometimes we thirst for more because what we thought was going to manifest didn't quite work out like we thought. That didn't bring the joy and the fulfillment like we had imagined and not and nor did the satisfying taste we hoped for. We were uh, we just run to the next prayer request. We go and ask somebody, can you stay and pray with me? And we just keep running on because we thirst for more. The call that's on your life and my life. Not the call we make to quench our knees with a certain tap water or touch that certain reserved boo or spouse. No, the call that I'm talking about is from Jesus. It's the call that has been placed on our lives for an appointed time, a prepared place, a designated purpose for our active participation. But when our thirst becomes parched and needs refreshing or needs to try a new beverage instead of that old sweet tea, that same orzaka, the same adult beverage, that's when Jesus is calling our spiritual attention to come and taste and see what the living water Jesus has today, even in the transition positions of life and as we're welcoming the next into our lives we don't have to fill out a survey to qualify for the living water you don't have to present your confirmation number to get uh, the package of living water to quench your thirst there's not a maximum there's not a minimum requirement of how many bottles of living water we can consume it's everlasting and available anytime any place we need to refresh our thirst so that living water Jesus can fulfill this earthly assignment and Jesus says oh come and taste and see that I'm the living water and so I can accomplish my mission and the scripture can be fulfilled and we won't thirst anymore you might have taken up your crosses by replacing water with another clear substance like vodka or meth or less harmful substances like Mary Jane but I'm here to tell you practice water worship admit thanks empty and request has been contaminated because you've you've gotten some type of discoloration because somebody has been talking to you without giving you forewarning that God is still trying to get your attention Maybe the transition you're in is God's way of ushering in tranquility or emphasizing to someone that you need to grow up and step up. The transition was not an accident. It was permitted by God for you to use the lessons to write the book. The lessons were the seeds God allowed to be planted. And while you have been watering everybody else's garden, now it's time for you to till your own dreams and write and self-publish the book. So when you've been praying for God to enlarge my territory, guess what? The book is going to be that extra income so you can continue to serve God with joy and gladness. Transitions are a sign that something 
something new or something else is on the horizon. So while God is allowing time to pass, to tailor make our next chapter of our lives, our next opportunity to minister about God's merciful love, the next unexpected time to sow seeds to help someone who doesn't know us and cannot return the generous uh, financial blessing, God is requiring all of us to turn our attention to the text of why Jesus is thirsty in the first place. Not just us, but why Jesus is thirsty. Jesus is thirsty for us to return to him when our well springs for moving forward are feeling like they're dried up due to a lack of excitement and tenacity and vitality or motivation. Jesus wants to quench his thirst by making him our Lord, our Savior, not just when you know the details of the plan, but also while he has instructed us to keep going, keep seeking, keep growing, keep asking me, keep knocking, keep fulfilling his will for our lives while we are in transition. So you may have to pause to reacquaint yourself with what's your real why and God-given purpose, but keep moving toward Jesus. When we taste and see that Jesus is the living water that quenches our thirst, our souls will be refreshed, renewed, and redeemed. So when Jesus sees our effort to practice taking in the authentic worship, to admit we don't have it all together, giving thanks while we wait, emptying ourselves before the Lord and make our requests known to invite and receive Jesus' power, we will suddenly and gradually notice our taste for Jesus will start to come back to life. The drought we were in due to the seasons of religious routines will suddenly and gradually experience a drip of water because we are moving toward a relationship with Jesus again. You might have lost your taste and tenacity for certain religious events and, and, and routines, but when we take on practicing water and drinking the living water, it's time for us to pay attention to the signs around us. Transitions tell us it's time to leave the familiar and lean into the unfamiliar, the uncharted territory, because Jesus has other assignments for all of us to taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the real relationship Jesus desires for us to have with him. So my brothers and my sisters, don't lose your taste for Jesus' next chapter coming into our lives because our thirst hasn't been quenched yet. Yes, transitions make us have different tastes and make us thirsty for more things. But remember to practice water because Jesus will quench her our thirst if only we come taste and see that the Lord is still good be blessed scriptural text for this word is from the Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 30 which reads when Jesus had received the wine he said it is finished then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit the theme for this homily is entitled, A Wonder-Filled Moment of Handover. A Wonder-Filled Moment of Handover. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are my strength, O Lord, and my Redeemer. Amen. Recently, I've had a few wonder-filled moments, 
Around these words, it is finished. I recently wondered about Katanji Brown Jackson and her Senate confirmation, and if she ever uttered these words, it is finished. I've recently wondered about Nicole Hannah-Jones and her tenure challenges, and where she is now at Howard University. And I wondered if she ever uttered the words, it is finished. I even wondered recently about Chris Rock and whether these words came to his thought of mine, it is finished. And Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, is being attacked by and in war with Russia. I wondered if these words recently ever came to his mind, it is finished. And I've recently wondered about Don Staley and Mike Krzyzewski and Hubert Davis or Shaheen Holloway or even the late John Thompson. Whether these words ever came to them in, during, or after the game, it is finished. Those are a few of my recent wonder-filled moments. And this text also provides a wonder-filled moment to us on this good day. Yes, it could not occur until Jesus' thirst was fulfilled prophetically and as we just heard with sour wine. Yet when Jesus etches into history the Greek word to tell us that, it is a wonder-filled moment. To tell us that, that accounting term meaning paid in full. When, when, when Jesus engraves into history, to tell us that, it is finished, paid in full. It is a wonder-filled moment. I tell you, it's a wonder-filled moment. And actually, it's a wonderful moment when Jesus says it is finished. Even though Jesus had been nailed hands and feet to a cross, which he had been forced to carry to Golgotha's hill, even though that cross that Jesus' body is on was dropped into the ground, into a hole, jolting him entirely, even though his breathing had to have been impaired from this Roman execution technique, even though it was hot and not only was there sweat pouring from his body, but also blood streaming from his head with a pressed down thorny crown into his brow. It was a wonder filled and a wonderful moment, even though there was agonizing pain. Because, because Jesus, at that moment in time, with the soundness of mind, with the presence of consciousness, uttered this full sentence, not a phrase, it is finished. Yeah. It is finished. He uttered that in victory, yes, knowing that he had accomplished the work that God had assigned to him. This word, it is finished, is actually a moment of confidence for him with the completion of God's work in this world assigned to him, paid in full. This word is not a moment of defeat or despair or abandonment as one prior word might seem, nor a moment of quiet self-giving trust for a word yet to come. But this word, to tell us that, it is finished, paid in full, even in the midst of pain, is a cry of triumph, a cry of achievement, because Jesus had completed the work that in this world that the Creator God had given to His hands. 
his work had paid for. Yeah, yeah. The fullness of humanity's debt. Oh, it's a wonder. It's a wonder-filled word. And, and it's a wonderful moment because through Jesus' efforts, that work of saving humankind from all of our sinful nature was finally completed, paid in full. Well, this is a wonder-filled and wonderful moment, not only because Jesus said, it is finished, but also because as the latter part of John 1930 says, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And all that really means is he handed over his life to God. Oh, that's a wonderful and wonderful moment of handover, my friends. It's a wonderful and wonderful moment of handover in the midst of pain because that's exactly what Jesus said he was going to do in the first place. You remember back in John chapter 10, verse 18, where he said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down on my own. All he was doing even in that horrid, painful circumstance was handing over his life to God. Handing over his life was an act of affirming power and authority. Handing over one's life situation after one has done what one has been called to do is a potent act of follow-up. Handing over your life after you've completed your assignment is a compelling act of follow-up. When you know that you have completed the unique assignment that God has created you and only you to complete in this world to the glory of God, just hand it over. Just hand it over. In those challenging and painful moments, hand it over in dignity. In those challenging and painful moments, hand it over in integrity. In those challenging and, and painful moments, hand it over in decency. Hand it over in self-respect. Hand it over in power. Hand it over with joy of completing the mission assigned to you in all confidence. Just hand it over with all confidence that God is going to do the rest. Oh, on this good day, thank you, Jesus, for such a wonderful and wonderful moment of handover. Luke 23, verse number 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. My brothers and sisters, I want to arrest your attention today with the title, I'm Not Crazy. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I haven't lost my mind. That's the wrong neighbor. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor, I'm not crazy.
I'm not, I'm not crazy. December 5th, 2021, Netflix released or produced a film that dealt with the climate and culture of where we are as a human race today. Where in fact you can state something that is true and factually verifiable. And you are made to feel like you are crazy. The movie, my dear friends, that I'm referring to is Don't Look Up, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. And I don't want to spoil the film for those who haven't seen it, so I will just relay to you what is already in print online. Two low-level astronomers must go on a giant media tour to warn mankind of an approaching comet that will destroy planet Earth. And they have six months before the comet hits and completely wipes out the Earth. But nobody is taking them seriously. N nobody is taking them seriously, not even the White House. One of the astronomers is on the verge of losing her mind because she cannot understand why people are not taking her seriously. She's confused because she's literally telling the world that we've got six months before an object the size of Mount Everest takes out existence as we know it. And she screams in frustration, what is wrong with you? There's a comet coming and our days are numbered. My brothers and sisters, can I put a quarter in the meter for a moment and park when I tell you, Dr. Shallas, that sometimes when God shows you something, you've got to walk by yourself. That not everybody will believe you. Not everybody will walk with you and not everybody will have your back. Sometimes the things that God shows us, we've got to walk it by ourselves. We've got to walk it by ourselves and, and really figure out if I believe what God showed me. You don't believe me. Come here, Noah. God told Noah to build an ark. And some theologians believe that up until this point, it has never rained. Because in Genesis 2 and 6, the Bible said that now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the surface of the ground. Now, if we are to believe that line of thought and that, uh, that ideology, it is safe to say that Noah sounds absolutely nuts saying it's going to rain. Noah sounds absolutely crazy talking about it's going to rain and building an ark. Come here, Abram. Uh, God told Abram that he would be the father of many nations. 
but then turns around and tells him to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Now, now I've got a problem here because if he's going to be the father of many nations, how in the world is it that he's going to sacrifice the only seed he has? And it sounds absolutely crazy. Come, come here, Joseph. Uh, God shows Joseph a dream. And, and, and Joseph tells his mother, his father, and his brothers that uh, the sun and the moon bow down to me. He tells them that I'm going to rule over you and then turns around and gets placed in a pit and then after the pit he gets put into prison. He's, he says I'm going to rule over you and all of these things happen making him look and sound absolutely crazy. Uh, come here Moses. Moses tells uh, God tells Moses on the backside of the desert that I want you to set my people free. As a matter of fact, I need you to go to the most powerful man in the land and tell him to let my people go. Uh, Moses stands uh, in front of the Pharaoh but with nothing but a staff and he declares what thus saith the Lord but he sounds absolutely crazy. Come here, David. God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse. And he says, there will I choose a king. And when he gets to the house of Jesse, Jesse brings out all of his sons and, and he looks at the sons and he, he says, surely God's anointing is upon you. And God says, this one I have rejected. For man looks at the outer appearance, but it is the heart that God observes. I, I, I've got a problem that Samuel is at Jesse's house because at the time that Samuel is at Jesse's house declaring that David would be king over Israel, Saul is already on the throne. And it sounds absolutely crazy. But can I tell you that Whatever God says, it's got to come to pass. Isaiah 55 and 10 reminds us, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from the heaven, and returneth not thither, but where watereth the earth, and maketh bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. He says that it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, what that got to do with our text tonight? It, it, it was always Jesus' assignment to die. As a matter of fact, John 1 29, John sees Jesus coming afar off and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It was always Jesus' assignment to die. And, and, and Jesus had told his disciples on multiple occasions that he was going to die. He told him in Mark chapter 9. He told him in Matthew chapter 17. He told him in Luke chapter 9. And, and all of those things sounding absolutely crazy. He, he told them that uh, one of you is going to betray me. And, and the disciples started looking around saying, not me, Jesus, not, 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 not I. We boys, we've been walking together for a while and I, I'm not going to betray you. He told them that one of you will deny me, not me, Jesus. I ain't going to deny you. We've been, we've been holding it down like four flat tires. I, I'm not going to deny you. He told them that he would die. But remember, I told you that uh, whatever God says is got to come to pass. And, and, and 
and all of this sounding crazy, he, he, he says this, knowing that uh, the word should not return unto him, unto him void. He, he tells them that he's going to die. And brothers and sisters, in Luke 23 and verse number 46, part B, the Bible says he breathed his last. So while it seemed like what was coming out of his mouth was crazy, in Luke 40, 23 and verse number 46, he dies. When he told them that I will be betrayed and I will be handed over, he was betrayed and handed over. When he told them that one of you will deny me before the crow, the cock crows three times, somebody denied him. He, he, he says all of these things and he sounds absolutely crazy, but in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 46, he dies. And look at your neighbor and say, I'm so glad that he died. Because he did is exactly what he said he was going to do. Now, I don't know if you've been listening to me for the last six minutes, but uh, what I've done for you tonight is I've laid out Jesus' resume and his credibility. That no matter what he says, it's got to come to pass. If God said it, it's got to happen. But I want to let you know that there's one more thing that he told them. That there's one more thing that he told them. And, 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 and I'm not trying, I promise, I promise pastors, I know, I know the protocol. I'm not trying to get him up out the grave tonight. But, but, but there's one more thing that he told them. There, there's one more thing that he told them, and it's in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Hear what thus the, says the Lord. He says, they were looking intently into the sky. And as he was going up, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. But men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken away from you. He says that he will come back in the same way that you've seen him. And, and I don't know if you've been listening to me tonight, uh, but the scripture simply said that he told them that he's coming back. Yeah. He, he told them that he's coming back. Uh, and, and, and it may sound crazy to people who don't believe, uh, but we who are believers yeah. in Jesus Christ, who knows what God has done time after time, how he paid your light bill, how he's continued to take care of you, how he watched over you all night long, but when death tried to snuff you out and God still watches over you, we know that when God speaks, it comes to pass. And so I want to let you know tonight that he's coming back. It's not a figment of my imagination. It's not something that I just thought about. It's not something that I'm thinking about. It's not something that I'm doubting about. But I know that God is coming back. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I know he's coming back. And I'm not crazy. I know he's coming back. And I'm not crazy. One day, the sky is going to crack open. And the Bible says he's going to come riding on a white horse. And on his thigh says king of kings. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm not crazy. He's coming back. What you have heard on today. 
preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone may be here this evening and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And today we want to give you an invitation and an opportunity as we all stand. We're not going to leave after the invitation, but I want us to all stand and I want to invite someone to a time of fellowship as we sing this song together. How many of you know over the last two years we definitely have come this far by faith? Come on. Is there one? Is there one? Maybe saying, Pastor Williams, I'm looking for a church home where we have a whole lot of pastors on this front row who love to be your pastor. Is there one today? His testimony that we've come this far by faith. Is that one? You might be seated to continue to sing.
May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace, peace. May he bless you in your uprising and your downsetting, in your leisure and in your labor. May he bless you in your going out and in your coming in. You and I, my brothers and sisters, are highly blessed. So let's walk with our Jesus swag and remember that we're not arrogant, but we are holy bold because of what he did for us. Now may the grace of God, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with each of us now, henceforth, and forevermore is our prayer. The mighty matchless name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. All who heard and believed, said together, Amen.